dynamic of an individual. Let me tell you just a little bit about him. He is the Chief Planning and Economic Development Officer for the City of Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, he's been doing that for a long time, and he's an award-winning uh, public planner, private planner uh, of over 25 years of experience, uh, nationally recognized as a leader in our profession, uh, and has had a varied background, including stints in New York City, Washington, D.C., and other locales. He has taught graduate courses at four or five major universities in the United States, uh, and it's really my pleasure and honor to introduce to you your president of the National Association of the at least American Planning Association, Mitch Silver. Process Association. 
with the American Planning Association. So please put process in its proper context. But more importantly, there is a big difference between planning and zoning. And the public confuses that all the time, except in Florida, because I hear your planning statutes are a bit different. But planning basically is a policy document that sets your vision and values for the future. It should not be a regulatory document. It should not have shalls and musts in it. It is a guide that has your vision and values, and then you code for it. That is where regulations come from. And so that is the connection. And those codes should protect the public health, safety, and welfare. And unfortunately, the trend over the last 100 years is that we went away from public health, safety, and welfare, and they become community-wide homeowner association documents. And I think over the next 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to have that conversation as what is the next iteration of our zoning code. And if you remember the evolution of zoning, because I like to remind a lot of my friends that it the first was adopted in 1916, but it was really driven by property owners because prior to zoning, the way we zoned property was through restrictive covenants, deed restrictions, and basically people sued each other because they didn't like what was next door. And it really wasn't working. And the biggest concern at that time, which they had these covenants, was they were concerned about multifamily housing. It wasn't industrial uses. The biggest concern was multifamily housing and then selling homes to blacks and Jews. That's, and it proved to be ineffective. And so the business community approached the U.S. Commerce Secretary and saying, said you have to do something. And then that is how they created the state enabling and state zoning legislation back in the 1920s. Now, there's a long history about what happened from then, uh, from then till now but it's important that you understand that context. So what is happening to our country? We are urbanizing. If you go back to the 19th century, our population was 5 million. Urbanized population, roughly 6%. By the 20th century, because of immigration, population swelled to 76 million. Urbanized population, 30%. We're now at 281 million, 90%. By the 22nd century, our population will be over half a billion with our urbanized population at 90%. And I do remind people in the audience that a person born today could be alive to see the 22nd century. So it is not that far away. For some of us, we won't see it, but a child born today could be 88, 89, and actually see the 22nd century. So planning is something we need because we respond to growth and change. We're going to grow over the next 50 years by 124 million people in this country. And somewhere we have to find where to place 50 million new housing units. That is our challenge. And as we work with community, it's not how we do it, but really how we integrate this with roads and transportation and all the things we know that's important. And at the same time, the world will grow by 2.3 billion people. Now, this slide is very important because I share it very often. I want to explain to you that planning has been around roughly for about 150 years. It started as a profession in the turn of the century, uh, the 20th century, but it's been around for over 150 years. The birth of our profession, because of uh, public health issues and people moving from the country to the city. But the point of this slide is that planning evolves. It doesn't stay the same. It evolves, and right now we're moving out of this era of sustainability and smart growth, and we're moving into something else. All these things have a shelf life, and planners always respond to the issues of their time, and the profession evolves. 20 or 30 years from now, if you're a young person, you're going to say, do you remember that term sustainability? Oh, yeah, I remember that term. Because right now it's all we're talking about, but if you look back in time, we evolve and we move on. And the question right now is, with the emerging trends that are happening, what's next? I like the title of your conference, Chart the New Course, because everyone's asking that question. What's the new normal? What's the new economy? What's next? And we're asking the same question as we start the second century of our applying profession. And it's not just you. It's not just us. You will I, 
The architects, landscape architects, everybody's asking, what's next? So as far as I'm concerned, this is an extremely exciting time in our profession, and I'm very pleased that you're part of it. But my biggest concern in all of this is that I believe that some of us, some of us, have lost our sense of purpose as planners. We forgot why we're doing this in the first place. And I'm hopefully through this presentation that I will remind you, or you need to think about when you went to planning school and decide to get this profession, why you did it in the first place, and first and foremost. And this is unique to planners. Although we have elected planning commissions, elected officials, that you are guardians of our future. You think about the future and make sure that we're prepared for it, and very few professions have that high honor. That your job is to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. And I challenge planners that if you don't do it, who will? Who will look for those emerging trends? Who will look to the future to make sure that we are covered, that we have their back? And we're one of the few professions that actually have that honor because we have that code of ethics. I always use this analogy that when I go to a court of law and I, I see that there's a judge and a jury, there's a, a plaintiff and there's a defendant, and each one is represented by an attorney. And then I say, that's, that's interesting because that's, that's fair. That's how it should work. And then I look at a planning commission and I see, well, there's a planning commission, I guess the judge and jury. And then we have, you know, a, a plaintiff uh, who's arguing for the developer, their point of view. And then I turn around and say, well, who's representing the defendant? Who's representing the public? And very often, the planners don't really want to intervene to say anything. My job is I represent the public interest, and I'll be as passionate as that attorney representing that private developer to make sure that the public interest is taken care of so that the planning commission or the decision makers can have a balanced response. Planners is part of our ethical responsibility that we shall have a special concern for the long-term consequences of present actions. It's hard sometimes. I'm sweating under my arms. I don't know what to say, but guess what? There are also consequences for no action. And in fact, I see that line as the biggest tragedy going right now across many local governments. I'm not going to do anything as if the problem is going to go away. And we have to communicate the consequences of taking no action. Because no action is an action. Knowing there's a problem and you don't want to deal with it, that's an action. And we as planners not only have to talk about the consequences of taking an action, but also of taking no action. And something I like to share with our community, we have this conversation, when you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. In Atlanta, just recently, you heard about it, they said no to this major transportation bond. Yay! We, no, we didn't win. The problem didn't go away. And there are consequences for that no. And we can all figure out what it's going to be long term because already in Atlanta, they're losing jobs, they're not gaining jobs because the region is so congested. So they had to know that there are consequences for that no action. I hope they get their act together. If people say no to rental units in some communities, what you're really saying is seniors and young people, we don't want you in our community. So we have to be careful when you say no, you're saying yes to something else. And so if you heard me at the national conference, it is for that reason I am asking all of you to remember to fall back in love with your planning, your, with uh, your profession again, with planning, because your community needs you. They really do. The issues are that imperative. And I joke around because I want all of you to decide to take your planning, your zoning code, and your conference plan and take them out for a nice romantic dinner. <laughs> Have that little small talk. Oh, I love your height regulations. I love your rear set. I'm sorry, just <laughs> And then if you're really daring, because we all, how many believe in healthy living, active living? Well, then maybe uh, you've heard of a co diet. I think it's time, I'm sorry, low diet. I think it's time to tell you to go on a diet. We have to relieve and write the term reform. I mean, all those years of eating all those text changes and zoning provisions, it starts to show. And we have to start slimming them down to make sure that they are more highly functioning documents. Now, did you know that in 2009, Time Magazine identified recycling suburbs as one of the 10 big ideas for changing our world right now? 
In 2009, U.S. News & World Report named planning as one of the top 50 professions in 2010. And you heard from the survey, plans were viewed as number three in terms of profession to help solve some of the community problems. What do they know that you don't know? Because I talked to planners, they believe as if you, know, you no longer are relevant. You are very relevant. And the community through that survey is selling you that they need you. And there's a new expectation for leadership. More and more mayors are calling me. They're looking for people who have vision, solutions, big ideas, courage, as Brian said, to solve the tough challenges they have. And I have to shrug my shoulders because I don't know many of them. That's what they're demanding of you. They want you to step up. And so many of us, I think, for a long time concerned about job security, forget why we're in this profession in the first place, and we decide to be comfortable and take the easy road. Does your community demand excellence from you? When I was hired by my city manager, he said, I'll help make us a great city. Could you imagine that calling? Help make us a great city. I was so excited. Most places I know, the way they talk about government, how does that inspire staff to do great things? Planners, you're going to have to dig down deep to find that inspiration to do the right thing. And even playing directors, if you've been beaten down, maybe there's someone on your staff, maybe it's time for you to move over and let those innovative young people step up and start to chart the new future as we go forward. And I always challenge people, if you want to be valuable, you must show your value. So here's a report. Uh, Mary mentioned it. I'm sure Robin Rather talked about it. Oh, close to 80% of America supports community planning. That cuts across political, racial, geographic lines across the board. And that's something you need to remember. Because that's not the noise that we hear out there as we go out to our communities. So I'm going to talk about some of the emerging trends and what we need to talk about. So here's a list. I'm not going to go over each one. Ray and Brattle of America are what we know as the silver tsunami. They did not name that after me. Rise of single person households, traditional family. We'll go over a couple of these. But the point I want to make about this list is that this, these are game changers. These are game changers because on this list are trends that have never happened before. It's the first time. So you can't rewind back to the 20th century and figure out how to solve these problems. You can't Google to find the results about what to do for some of these issues. They're looking for creative solutions, innovation, something different to solve these problems. And you need to know how these issues are affecting your community. You've got to start looking forward to find out how you can provide that value and prepare your community for some of these emerging trends. I'll start first with what I call the demographic remix of the 21st century. Let's talk about aging, households, and families. The first, if you didn't know this, by 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. And not only will there be more of them by 2030, but by 2050, they'll be living longer. Because of advances in science and healthy living, by 2050, the number of Americans over the age of 85 will triple from 5 million to close to 20 million Americans. Had never happened before in America. Another first for our country. By 2025, the number of single person households will equal that of a family household. And by 2050, the overwhelming majority of household will be one person. Not a family, one person. I will share with you in a second the implications of this change. There's also something called a natural decrease. Initially, uh, the census, someone called it Dunning Counties. They felt that that was not a politically correct term to use. But 25 out of all counties in the U.S. are what we call fading away. That the number of people dying and those being born are not keeping pace. What's offsetting it is migration. And so what we're finding is West Virginia was the first state to experience natural decrease. The common thread in shrinking counties consists of older whites who can no longer have children, combined with their young people, their children saying, I'm not staying here. I don't like the lifestyle, I don't like the jobs, I'm leaving. Now, fortunately for Florida, you have very few places, it looks like the Keys. Um, maybe somebody can tell me those places here, I'm not sure, is one. They, where is that right there? Pinellas County. Pinellas County, and that is? Monroe. Monroe. 
that's what this was a test. Okay, that's the key. I know that. <laughs> so the good news is, Florida, you're not too bad. But I want to show you your neighbor. That's Alabama. Oh. <laughs> that's Alabama. And I can show you state after state where you see this shrinking taking place, and it's happening in Alabama. The entire Delta is almost disappearing. The only place is growing. Or looks like uh, you know, in terms of uh, just. Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, different parts. So this is a reality in many states. They cannot hold on to their young people. They are literally shrinking. Another shock is that uh, we're seeing a major change in uh, families. 1960s, five out of 100 children were born out of wedlock. By 2009, four out of 10. Four out of 10 children are born out of wedlock. And it's not just African Americans, it's every race. For whatever reason, a woman said, that's okay, I'll do it by myself. In fact, more than half of mothers in the United States under 30 are single. So this trend, when we plan for neighborhoods and for community services and for parks, families are changing. And you as planners have to, if you don't know this, I want to say shame on you, but I won't. You need to know this. You need to understand the demographics of what is happening in your community because you need to plan for that. Now, when I travel around and go to college campuses, I know a former student here I talked to back in 2009 from the UNC is in the audience. And I'm going to a presentation, I see this guy talking to this young lady through the entire presentation, and I'll tell, excuse me, young lady, he's not serious. How do I know? This chart tells me so. <laughs> For whatever reason, that sweet spot when people get married between the age of 25 and 34 went from close to 80% in the 1960s to almost half 50% today. So now, young people deciding not to get married, and when they do get married, most of them are saying, uh, we're either not going to have a child, or if I want to have a child, the woman says, oh, do it on my own. Families are changing for whatever reason they don't know why. This is who you're planning for. So what are the implications? Clearly, land use patterns and transportation choices will change as Americans get older and realize they can no longer drive. And now we begin to ask those questions of seniors. When we say, what are you going to do when you can no longer drive? Well, I'm going to rely on my friend. They said, wait a minute, that friend said she was going to rely on you. In fact, the latest number is over 600,000 people over the age of 70 stop driving every year. This is a wake-up call to a lot of local governments, and it should be a wake-up call to you. I think you know this already. You're trying to find those transportation choices. People will be isolated because many local governments can't paratransit their way out of this problem. It cannot be done. By 2015, 50% of all Americans over eight, the age of 65 or older left poor transit access. And Atlanta, sorry to pick on you, but in just three years, 90% of seniors in Metro Atlanta will live in neighborhoods with poor transit access. They're in a crisis mode. How did that happen? Because we all know as planners, you can't solve that problem in three years. That is a problem of the market. People say, let the market take care of it. I'm Decatur, don't tell me what to do. I'm Atlanta, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. And now, my question is, where's the market? Why aren't they stepping up to solve that problem? Now, they did put a transportation bond, it failed. They have a looming crisis on their hands. And we know as planners, this is something where we have to, and I'm sure the plans were there predicting years ago, this is where we're headed. Kansas City, they're number one in terms of small time, small, medium-sized metros. Raleigh Door, we're number five on the list. So from our perspective, we wanted to make sure for our residents, we had a plan in place, and we do. Other implications of aging population, this is exciting for planners. The older people get, the more nimby they become. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> we have our hands full. Tax base of local governments may be challenged. I don't know if your state allows seniors to uh, basically, uh, we allow tax deferral and tax relief for seniors over the age of 65. Do you have that in Florida? Yes? Wow. Well, keep an eye on it because we're seeing in many different places that number rising as a result. I don't know if you know this, but over the past five years, for over 400 local governments in the United States consolidated and just disappeared because of this issue. 
can no longer afford the tax base, and so they're consolidating. And we'll see that trend, that trend likely to continue. So definitely keep an eye on that trend because it now is affecting the tax base. Changing households. This is another one that we, in Raleigh, we saw the household size growing. We said, wow, people have more babies. Wait a minute, not exactly. Three trends, which is called multi-generational households. And I'm sure all of you are aware of this or experiencing this. The first is what we call the boomerang students. Save all that money, you send your kids to college, and they come right back to your house. <laughs> now, they're supposed to pay rent. All right, everybody? My son didn't. I'm still trying to collect the rent. <laughs> this is a short-term trend, uh, but it is still an issue that was going on during the, the last census period. Another one I'm sure some of you are going through right now, parents of older boomers and exers are now having to take care of their parents because they either can't afford or can't care for themselves. And then Hispanic households, which have always been multi-generational, their increase, we're now seeing an increase in multi-generational households. So these are some trends for you to be aware of. Implications of changing households, no surprise, you have a generation demanding different lifestyles, housing choices, smaller homes, uh, there's a preference to rent rather than own, so the community is <coughs> anti-rental. Uh, basically, you're saying to some young people and seniors, you can't live here. So this is where the implications of the novel has consequences. And then the experts estimate this excess inventory of 25 million single-family homes on the market by 2030, no line to buy. What it's basically saying, as we see more single-person households, that is the per that and the single-family homes is a disconnect between the buyer and the inventory. I know people are jumping on their smartphones right now, calling their spouses, saying, sell, sell, sell. You have time, don't worry, don't panic. We're trying to figure out what are we going to do. There is a huge disconnect. There are many reports now that start to figure out how will that housing be absorbed because a woman at the age of 29 is not going to live in a 4,000 or 3,000 square foot home by herself. And this is something now that we have to realize working with home builders. I'm meeting with the home builders in about another two months to figure out what we do about this trend. Another big trend, pre-war construction, built solid as a rock, post-war, mass-produced, built during the housing boom. The biggest question, I'm sure in Florida you're aware of this, is what will happen to that housing stock of the 80s and 90s when it reaches the age of 50? I can tell you about pre-war homes. Don't know about post-war. And as many of our subdivisions across this country. And we're seeing home sizes getting smaller. That is the trend. And it will continue to be the trend. And so my question is, just in the this part of the country, we expect 84 billion square feet of new construction. The home builder surveys are saying number one on everyone's list, energy efficiency and smaller homes. In fact, I spoke to a realtor and people are asking this question. I want a smaller home with lots of big rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it for a second. People are now asking for smaller homes with lots of big rooms. So that is now what the market is saying. So my challenge is that we have to work with some of the building codes to see can we get smaller homes of better quality that are greener, more resilient than the ones today? And that's going to be a challenge. You're going to have to start playing a role in the quality of that next 84 billion square feet of new construction. Now let's get into race and ethnicity, and this is the part where I'm sure by now you may have heard about this information. This has been going on for a couple of years. And if you did not know it by 2042, there'll be no majority race in the US. And by 2050, this is what America will look like. Uh, this was first reported on August 14, 2008. Everyone kind of missed it. It was on all the evening news. I was working on a, on a book at the time. But unfortunately, the reason why no one really knew about it, somebody named Sarah Palin was just nominated uh, to serve as vice president, sucked all the oxygen out of the news, and no one really paid attention to this news story. And now it continues on. So what does it say? Basically, white projects to lose population by almost 20 percentage points, and Hispanic population is expected to triple from 46 million to 132 million uh, by between 2008 and 2050. Now, let me be clear. This has nothing to do with immigration. You can put up all the walls, the shotguns, the nuclear missiles, the guard dogs. This has to do with the fertility rate of Hispanic women during their childbearing years compared to the dropping fertility rate of the other races. Also, we're going to see the rise of an inclusive city. By 2023, minorities will comprise more than half of all children in the U.S. By 2050, 62%.
This is the reality that's happening right now. This was the first year that non-white children outnumbered whites in terms of being born in the United States. So the trend is with us, and so as we plan, we're going to have to be prepared for what I call the inclusive city, the inclusive community, the inclusive county. This is where we're headed, and planners, you have to be at the front line to help deal with this change. And if you look at the legal immigrants, the breakdown of foreign born, what's interesting is that the percentages have not changed for over 100 years. It's just who the people are. This is the European and Canada and Canadians. Back in 1910, it was almost 96% Europe and Canada. Uh, if you look now, it's down to 14%. If you look at who are coming in this country today, it's primarily Africa, Asia, Central America, and South America. So we have the same percentage of foreign born. It's just they look very different. Now, this was put together by policy link. Uh, you can go on their website, but this is going to show on a county by county basis in the United States how this demographic change is going to play out in slides from 1980 through 2040. So, this is uh, basically uh, the beige is less than 30%, the darker the color is greater than 50%. So, this is the United States in 1980. 1990, let's keep an eye on Florida. 2000. This is where we are basically today, 2010, 2020, 2030, and then 2040. Is it that exciting? Oh, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're beginning to see play out in our national politics, unfortunately. And I think as planners, we're, again, we're going to be on the front line, as you can see if you look at the state of Florida. That you have to be prepared for this change. You know what's happening. You know what's going on right now. So this is going to be more and more of an issue in the coming decades. It's only going to increase over time. In fact, if you look at this chart, you can see the dramatic change just from the 1970s uh, to 2050. So planets, this is a reality that we have to deal with. There are many places, believe me, I've given this presentation over the country. I cannot tell you when I get to this part how people get up and just leave the room. As of leaving the room is going to change the numbers. It's not. And so I think that we have to be very real and figure out how to plan for this change. So the implications of what I call the Browning of America, there's no question, neighborhoods may become more diverse. It will vary from region to region, state to state. School diversity policies will be an interesting debate to watch because the United States, race and schools basically are synonymous. And I believe it's the 2020 census that will be the wake up call for America because these numbers are going to become even more real. The plan is you have a heads up. You look at what the trends are in your community, in your state, and you need to be prepared for them. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun about generations. Those of you who have seen this before, I will generalize. I promise you I will generalize. Don't take any of this personally, please. Uh, but when we plan, we look at the generations. We don't just look at it as one community, because each one of these generations, and believe me, everybody on this room is on this list. If you're not, you're dead. So I trust you to be on this list. Gen Z should not be here. They should be in school. But the reason why is that each one of these generations have values, needs, aspirations, and that drives consumer preferences and market demand. And communities basically is a preference. So you need to pay attention to this. Elected officials need to pay attention to this. Because I know developers pay attention to this. And we'll go through each one of these to see exactly what I mean. The analogy I like to use is that how many people either own or have ever used a Polaroid camera? Wow, how many people still use a Polaroid camera? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Well, here's the point. Thank you for not using your Polaroid camera, although they are trying to make a comeback. Is that there are still communities that want to build Polaroid camera communities for a digital camera generation. That's where we are right now. You know, that old fashioned, I don't know if you ever used to peek at it, oh, it's still gold, not ready yet. Things are changing. And so let's start first with the greatest generation. That's a picture of my father, World War II, and then right before he passed away a couple of months ago. My father fought in World War II, he lived through the Great Depression, not the Great Recession. The Great Depression. It was very different back then. My father understood the value of money. In fact, I grew up on hand-me-downs. I don't know if people still do that. How many people still grow up on hand-me-downs? 
You grew up on it? Come along. The problem is my brother was six foot four. So I'm all in. <laughs> it, it, it was terrible. <laughs> my father wouldn't buy anything new. He'd go to the garage. So you will not buy that new. We went to a garage sale, kind of fixed it up, you know, shined it up. It's like, Dad, please, this is embarrassing. Uh, but that was, that was that generation. They understood the value of saving before they bought something. But what defined this generation, in my, in my opinion, is some words from what I found in Thomas Friedman's book. They gave their today for our tomorrow. I'm going to repeat that again. They gave their today for our tomorrow. There has never been a generation since that's come close to my father's generation. It's different. Now, I don't think there's any one because they're 88 and above. Is there anybody here from the greatest generation, just so I can see? Not one. Well, there's about 1.5% of them left in our country, so can we please give them a round of applause and if you see them. <laughs> then we get to the silent chosen generation. Do we have any in here to wrote from silent chosen generation? Seriously? Huh? Okay, I saw a couple of reluctant hands go up. Okay. <laughs> be proud, be proud. This generation is interesting. Uh, this generation grew up during the suburbanization of America, the highway, the suburbs. For many places in the country, it was get out of the city as quickly as possible, get your own piece of earth that you can defend. It was that period of the rise of the traditional family. And so I understand their context, and there are many of them more enlightened, but very often, a lot of this age group are our elected officials, are our decision makers, and their orientation of the world is very different. Many of them that I know, when their child comes to say, I'm going to live downtown, have you lost your mind? Is it safe? <laughs> the only reason why you go downtown is to pay parking tickets or, you know, you don't live there. But many of them now realize as their children are moving there, they're actually following them. But this is a generation of rising the middle class. They too understood the value of savings. But their mindset about community was more suburban, low density, and really didn't understand the urban thing. And again, I'm generalizing. But many of them, again, are our elected officials today. Uh, how about boomers? Do we have any boomers here in the room? Oh, you're all so quiet. <laughs> I guess it's early in the morning. Well, the boomers, which I call the coolest generation in the face of the planet, <laughs> I call us the immortals. We have life form of prosperity. We want it because we want it, and we want it now. Uh, the boomers were amazing. There was the greatest explosion of prosperity ever on the face of our planet came under our watch. Uh, and uh, what was different about us, however, was that uh, while my parents saved before they bought, we just borrowed to buy. And that's kind of, sorry boomers, but that was our culture. It was the rise of consumerism, easy credit, and personal debt. That's why the greatest recession happened under our watch. But, you know, the issue about the boomers, and I think we're beginning to come to terms with this, I'm one of them, is that while my father gave their today for our tomorrow, the boomer was a generation that said, we're going to give away your tomorrow for our today. And that's the conversation we're having right now in America. And it's a gut check because I have to have a different conversation with my family. We are wanting to give away your tomorrow for our today. And it's a tough one. Then we get to the Gen X generation. All the poor Gen X, we call them the baby bus generation because there's so few of them. Any Gen Xers here in the room? Can I ask of the Gen X, how many have more than three siblings, three brothers and sisters? Wow, only a handful. This is the first time in America we start to see family size change. We didn't have these large families anymore. Women started going back to the workforce. Divorce rates start to rise. The beginning of daycare centers, latchkey, remember that? When I grew up, my grandmother took care of me. Now you have daycare center, latchkey children, and now you have all these informal relationships and families where you have a stepfather, stepbrother, stepsister, stepcat, stepdog. I mean, it's all mixed up. For the first time, traditional families started to change, and the Gen Xers grew up in this generation. What I like about the Gen X, although they like to work to live rather than live to work, because I think because they spent spend so much time with their imaginary friends. <laughs> My wife's genius. That you're really at the cutting edge of the 
you create a class that enriches part of the toxin. You're that, the beginning of that, and so I thank you, Gen X, for your creativity, but again, there aren't many of you around. Uh, that's why I call it baby bus generation. Now, why do we call it Gen Y generation Gen Y? Anybody knows? <laughs> So Gen Y, can you at least scream because everybody else is like, Gen Y, you know millennials? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Alright, we can call the Gen Y millennials and go boomers. What I like about this generation is that uh, you, know, they, you know a Gen Y because they want to be playing director after one year on the job, so you know who they are. <laughs> but they want choice. And this is the story I like to tell. This is a true story. When I grew up, I had a bunch of time. Uh, when I grew up, uh, and I went downstairs to ask my mom for breakfast, she said, you know, pancakes. And uh, <clears throat> when I watched my wife, and she does this every Saturday, even though she knows I do this in some of my presentations, my daughter comes down, she says, well, honey, we have eggs, pancakes, cereal, and she goes on and on and on. When I grew up, I had two choices. Remember, those of you my age, you either ate or didn't eat. <laughs> you get a full menu. <laughs> But now these kids have grown up. They don't just want choice, they demand choice. Do you ever hear the term transportation options, tra uh, transit choices? They've now grown up because we fed them on a diet of choice. What I also like about this generation is that no one loses, everybody wins. You showed up last, that's no, you came in last, that's okay. At least you showed up. Let's give them a prize. <laughs> Now, I'm joking around about Gen Y because the list I shared with you early on is going to happen under their watch. And I feel confident and encouraged because this generation is different. We have never seen a more purpose-driven generation than a millennial generation. And the timing is perfect. They are interning and volunteering at record levels, 80% of them, more than any, any other generation in one condition. It's got to have a purpose. No purpose, they walk. So the timing is perfect that the Gen Y, and I love how God works these things, had come at the perfect time because they will be dressing those emerging trends and they need your help. They cannot do it alone. So impart as much wisdom as you can because this generation is different. They're more racially and culturally tolerant than previous generations and a millennial generation will be the generation that will finally have the courage to deal with the race issue that previous generations could not deal with. So I want to give them a round of applause because we need to What else about this generation is place matters, not job. I mean, they're freaking us all out. We didn't grow up that way. They're concerned about place. And if you are, and, and plan as you know this, if you do not plan for that place, they leave. Why are they leaving the Delta? Why are they leaving parts of this country? Place matters. And we're seeing it happening all over the country. So that is very, very important. So that's the Gen Y generation. Gen Z, well, uh, a lot of similarities to Gen Y. They're still in high school. Uh, and so, but with the Facebook, social media culture, some amazing stuff happened during the lifetime. Uh, we're not really sure where it's headed. And now we're talking about the next generation, the next couple of years. People are trying to get famous, trying to figure out what the name's going to be. But we will see another generation emerge in the next couple of years. So, implications, clearly, uh, Gen X and Gen Y will be moving into leadership positions within the next 10 years. And their values will start to influence laws and politics, which is why you see this debate happening in America. These 80 million millennials will be the generation to watch. They will have as big of an impact as the boomers did for our culture. And there's going to be some serious tension over the next 10 years as the fight goes on between the American values, between X and Y, and the boomers and the silent generation. And you will see this all play out before your very eyes. This actually is playing out right now. I wish I had more time on this slide. I have to watch my time. But essentially, what I like to do is take all these generations and do a profile. I decided to put in Fort Myers, Tampa, and Florida. Uh, as you can see, what I try to do is look at the three X, Y, and Z, what I call the Gen Y, Z split, to see how many of them live in your community. 
In Raleigh, we're close to 70%. Fort Myers, 63.1%. Tampa, 64%. State of Florida, wow, 55.7%. A lot of old people here in Florida. <laughs> the United States, the median was 60%. The point about the slide is if you look at that number at the bottom of the list, and then you look at the silent, mature generation, what this is saying is that basically these are your elected officials. They're generally between 30, 35%. And my question is, if they're the decision makers and the leaders, are they willing to give up their today for their tomorrow? And most places is no. No. I'm gonna force you to live the way I understand the world, even though I won't be on a plan for another 20, 30 years. That is a challenge that we're facing in most local communities. Luckily in Raleigh, they understood that, and they bring in that 70% into the conversation because they know it's their tomorrow they're planning for. And we have to balance it out because very often communities will primarily listen to this group and not listen to that group. And so this is a very, I can spend a lot of time just on this slide. There are some slides, you can see the Gen Y generation drop to Gen X, which means you have a college town, you cannot keep your young people, they're going to other places. I was trying to do one for Gainesville, but I didn't know the sports mentality here in Florida and war will break out between Seminoles and hurricanes and food fight. I didn't know what was going to happen. Hurricanes and Seminoles. I'm missing some of that game. Is anybody else? You got them all? Bulls. Bulls. Oh. Bulls. This is important. This one is really important. And I'm very thankful for Raleigh. I communicated to this council early, and, and these folks stepped up. So we reached out to them. We do a committee process. Oh, we don't do a spread for public meetings. Because when we did public meetings, only the old folks came out. We decided that with N, X, Y, and Z, you have to go to them. They're not going to go to you. And so now we make sure we have an outreach effort that hits all the audience because we want to have a balance of public participation. So we had all sorts of events to reach out to the young people. We had a kid's city. This one was cute. We actually had the kids build a city. We actually mapped out uh, block outlines with lots. They had to actually get a permit before they could build them. They started jumping up and down and screaming, rolling on the floor. I said, oh, stop it. Were you a future developer? No offense. <laughs> <laughs> So the Board of Adjustment is over there. <laughs> it was intense. It was really intense. And also, we have to really communicate the value of planning by communicating outcomes of planning. I think the mayor was probably the biggest uh, champion of that. He said that earlier. And Raleigh's known as the best place across the country, but that didn't just happen. And we have to communicate why that happened. For 20 years, Raleigh was made the best, 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 best because we value planning. It is one of our competitive advantages. And we let the public know that. Businesses know that. Uh, so we were totally proud about that. So what we did in our community planning month uh, is that we celebrated 60 years of planning back in 2010. And I had an honor meeting all four plan directors. In case you can't find me, I'm the black guy that's in the gray. <laughs> and we celebrated the history because people didn't realize they love our community. It didn't just happen. It was planned. And we had to let them know that. And going forward, you want to talk to some of the trends is that you're going to have to learn how to communicate planning. If Robin Rather is having another session here, I encourage all of you to go to that session to learn how to communicate the values of planning. And so we talked about Herb Stevens. He's now still alive, 94. He was the first planning director in Raleigh. He talked about the Green Fingers and did our first comprehensive plan back in the 1950s. AC Hall, who actually implemented our nationally renowned Greenway system, which was a concept of Green Fingers. People said that was planned. I said, yeah, that was planned. It didn't just happen. We talked about George Chapman, which started the evolution of our downtown revitalization, and our urban format. We talked about these wonderful quarters. That was planned. Yes, that was planned. It didn't just happen. So sometimes you have to press the rewind button to communicate rather than vision for the floor, because people have a tough time looking into the future. Return on investment. The economic value of planning, you're going to hear that more and more, not just jobs, and I agree with Brian, is return on investment. I love this phrase from Mayor Chattanooga, if you aren't a city where people want to live, you aren't a city where people want to invest. 
When I work with businesses, they know when local government doesn't want to spend money. They want to invest, not just for the incentives. We want companies to establish roots in our community, to stay for a long time, not take the incentives and leave. And so we want to make sure we have a quality community that business wants to invest in. And so we had to communicate to our residents because they were going to say, why are you keep building downtown, 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 downtown? I said, well, I'll tell you why. If I take 600 single family homes on 150 acres, it would equal the tax value of one of our high rises downtown on one acre. So I told them, if you do not support downtown development, what you're really saying is raise my taxes in the subdivisions. And that's when they realized, wait a minute. Because that building doesn't require fire and schools and the same investment as that neighborhood does. That building has 90 times the tax value as that. And so we got the message across, not just downtown, main streets, lifestyle centers, we just want to make it clear. And so we just told them, downtown, high rise, three, uh, three acre site, pays off its uh, infrastructure, three years, return on investment, 35%. Suburban complex, it would take 42 years to pay off infrastructure. Return on investment, 2%. Now, anybody who's smart says this makes a lot of sense. But local government, like the local government, votes that way. The same thing happens here in Florida. And we start to look at the return on investment and the cost of scroll. And I'm not going to spend too much time on getting near the end, but Joe Minicosi, Peter Casper here in Sarasota did similar charts to show the value on a per acre basis of a residential versus a six story which outperforms the mall, which outperforms commercial. You as planners can help change your community by looking at the value of land and plan differently. Forget about that high rise. Just a six story building in Asheville produces 250,000 per acre to a county residential of 1,200. Same acre, different location. So we did an enrollment game and we found, what do you think downtown, as you can't see here, but this is the spike of our downtown, there's our midtown. And we found even in Raleigh, same thing. It outperformed Walmart, it outperformed our mall, downtown mixed use six story building. Six story, brought in that type of revenue. So we got smart, so you know something? We're gonna include this in our plan. We're not gonna just give you these nice charts for this presentation. And so we decided to do our conference plan, 2009 it was adopted. Our challenge was we had to figure out a way to find 270,000 people to live and 170,000 jobs. That was our challenge as we did our projections, but we only had 19,000 acres left. Low density was no open option. We shared this with our residents and they agreed before we started. So we came up with a plan that had a growth framework. 60 to 70 percent of all the growth would be in eight growth centers in 12 quarters. So now seniors had a place to live. Young people had options and it wasn't all going to be suburban, built on a rail line. 96% of the public voted in favor. 96, let me repeat that. 96% of the public supported the plan. Please tell me, anybody in the room ever had 96% support? I mean, it was shocking because we did our outreach and we told them about some of the emerging trends. And so the land value I talked about, we identified, we're now going to rezone all of this land and increase the land value for the developers and the landowners that give them instant value to start redeveloping. And we put in our comprehensive plan, return on investment, that all capital projects uh, should now be subject to return on investment analysis, not just wide the road because we want to widen it. You've got to show us return on investment so that we can use the taxpayers' money product. I'm running out of time, so let me get to the end here. Creative placemaking, uh, that is also a major important to what we're doing. We look at APA, like you have here, making great communities happen. We want to create great places by leveraging that public investment. And as a result, we're able now to be one of the lowest tax places, high quality community in North Carolina. So in closing, we want to lead the regulatory reform. We address those market trends. We came up with the form based code. We now are coming up with a variety of options uh, for cottage courts because again we want to do regulatory reform as well. Uh, this is a cottage court by the way. Who wants to live there? It's pretty nice. <laughs> and backyard cottages, accessory dwellings, are they illegal here in Florida? We have one hand. Only one? Two. 
they are legal. It's a bit controversial where we are, but we want to look for housing diversification. So this could be a standalone unit over the garage. So that could be if you're boomeranging a child, your parent, or your husband or wife. If they get on your nerves, is the question you can <laughs> So as I close, we are talking about what is next. Uh, APA has launched a big ideas task force. We're looking at the next 50 years. Uh, we'll be launching a second forum in DC, and we're gonna have sessions around the country. We want you as members to start to share with us how to plan for the next 50 years. The big mega trends, clearly water, climate change. We're gonna be a little bit more bold about climate change. We're not concerned about some of the deniers. We all know it's gonna be a major issue, particularly for you here in Florida. And we're gonna step it up and talk more about climate change. Uh, but water, climate change, uh, health, consolidation, change of local government, so there is a YouTube video where we started this effort to talk about the trends over the next 50 years. But we want to have forums around the country, online forums, so we definitely encourage you uh, to participate. Uh, that is why if I had to sum up our uh, strategic plan for APA, I'd have to say it's lead, inspire, and innovate. And I want to read something as I close that's actually in our comprehensive, in our strategic plan. We must inspire our members to reach new heights of creativity, energy, and innovation in planning. A new era in planning is underway. Whether we call it a planning revival, renaissance, or rebirth, we must communicate to leaders and decision makers that planners protect the public interest and our guardians of our common future. Based on emerging trends, we are the profession of those who are not only looking at the long-term consequences of present actions, but are working on solutions to reduce the uncertainty about the future while enhancing the economy and the quality of life. So in closing, who will address these emerging trends? Can you, can we give our today for the next generations tomorrow? That is a conversation you all need to have with yourselves, with your elected officials, and with your community. We have to remember that there are consequences for present actions as well as no actions. We have to be courageous to be able to communicate them. We have to remember the great legacy of planning you will leave behind for present and future generations. And finally, as I said, the reason why we need you to be passionate about this profession again is because your community needs you. Thank you very much.
primary focus. And working with the bloggers is key. We have a lot of good friends that do a lot of work for us because they like the work that we do. Yes, sir. Uh, I saw how you addressed the issue with like the growing crowding of the job generations. Uh, one of the problems that we've seen is that a lot of these kids are not that ready from high school. And I just wanted to see if, if in your city you have any plans or if they are thinking about this situation, how do you get these minority kids to get a grant of education? Because the prosperity of the country is going to be dependent on that. How do we work with, I'm trying to figure out that how do we work with from high school? Well, I can kind of incorporate the problem we have. Oh, graduation? Increasing the graduation rates, yeah, if you want to see that. I have to say that we're not directly involved uh, on dealing with the graduation rate. I mean, clearly, if you look at the survey, uh, the public wants planners to be involved in education. So it's kind of a wake-up call for all of us to play a greater role aside from just, you know, facility planning. So I don't have an answer. We don't have a direct involvement on how we help the young people uh, through graduation. Although, I've been telling a lot of community groups, it's a small thing that if we get involved in the planning process, I do request that two high school people be involved in the planning process to shadow us throughout the process so they can begin to see how things work. Each time I try, they promise they will, and then it never comes to pass. But that's a small measure. The big problem about high school uh, dropouts is, is pretty big. Don't know how class can get involved, but I agree with you they should. Yes, sir. Uh, you spoke about how the okay. aging population uh, will be more likely not to drive their cars anymore um, past a certain age. Could you speak about some of the solutions that you that you know about that some planning officers are taking to kind of provide those public transportation services to those today? Well, it's not just seniors; it's young people. Young people more and more are beginning to shed their car; they don't want it. Uh, I think. What they call age, uh, lifelong communities. Atlanta is doing some outstanding work uh, in aging in place in lifelong communities. So that's one of them, but that's really planning up front. Uh, the question is how, do, how are communities dealing with the aging population uh, and planning for them? So aging in place, lifelong communities uh, on the front end. But other than that, paratransit and finding some type of buddy system is the only other way. I mean, this is going to be a big, big problem. People are just going to be isolated and may have to go back to farming on the land because they just can't get to certain places uh, for basic services. So this is something that, quite frankly, I just left a conference on the aging of uh, dealing with all the southeast planners that deal with aging in AARP. So AARP is heavily involved. We're now teaming up with them and APA uh, to figure this out. So right now there aren't many solutions, but I think going forward, uh, some of the seniors are voting by themselves and moving to places that are well connected, but some of them financially don't have the means to do that. So this is a growing problem, particularly with that number of over the age of 70 seems to be the number. Now people in their 90s still drive. In Florida, I've seen them. <laughs> but there are a variety of ways we need to deal with it, but those are some examples. I would look at the Atlanta Regional Planning Commission. Right now they're one of the leaders, uh, in my opinion, doing some work, as well as AARP. They're actually stepping up because they realize this is a problem as well. So I see Merle coming here, so let me thank you all, and I'll be here another day. And on behalf, as president, I want to thank you for the work that you do. A lot of times you don't think it's very thankful in other presentations. I try to go through all the different ways you've impacted people's lives and everything. So on behalf of the American Planning Association, I want to thank you for the work that you do because whether you realize it or not, you are making a difference. We're a profession that we don't often get thanked, but I want to thank you for the work that you do because it, it does truly make a difference. Thank you very much.